yeah uh, so before the break uh, we were looking at jesus statement that um, verse 54 specifically it says whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and i will raise them up at the last day so uh, jesus says uh, you are longing for the manna of moses physical bread which can temporarily meet your needs but he says i am the bread of life if you believe in the words that i am speaking and you believe in me that i am from uh, the father and that i am the promised messiah then i can impart eternal life to you so is what he says so he says therefore you must eat my flesh and drink my blood in the sense all that i am saying absorb it into your innermost being you know um, let it become a part of of uh, how you live uh, what you cho choose to do so let it become the very core of your being everything that i'm saying to you and all that i am you know accept it uh, believe it is what he says so some people they misinterpret it and they say oh he's asking us to eat his flesh but then there are others uh, who who grumble and they say um we like we saw in verses 41 and 42 they say uh, is this not jesus uh, the son of joseph whose father and mother we know how can he now say i came down from heaven so he is just a human being so why should we um, eat and drink what he is telling us you know and make um, make it a, a part of us why because he's just a human so why should we do that and uh, so you know jesus says um, that he is not just from the earth he says that he is from above um maybe uh, we could look at verses uh, we we already looked at verse 32 okay we did not read it out but then if you look at verse 32 it says um jesus said to them very truly i tell you it is not moses who has given you the bread from heaven but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of god is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world so jesus is making the point that he is not just a human um, born from joseph and mary but rather he has come down from heaven so he says if you accept this if you believe that i am from above uh, then i can impart eternal life to you so um this other set of people who are not willing to accept what he says because they are only looking at his human origin um so to them he says uh, in verse 61 and 62 he says a way that his disciples were grumbling about this jesus said to them does this offend you then what if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before okay so here when it says the term disciples it's not just referring to the 12 persons you know who generally travel along with him and spend all their time with him it's talking about all of his disciples you know all of his followers um many of, many of whom had in fact now joined jesus because of the spectacular miracles that he was doing and especially because he started providing them with food uh, so uh, jesus is um, addressing these people and he is saying uh, you are grumbling because i am saying that you must feed on me uh, you are grumbling because you're saying i'm just of human origin but um, i am declaring to you that you know i have come down from heaven um, because in verse 58 he says this is the bread that came down from heaven so he's um, repeating that he is from above and not just of human origin and so he says in verses uh, so the, the people grumble and in, in uh, verse 60 on hearing it many of his disciples said this is a hard teaching who can accept it so these people are finding it a hard teaching not because they have misunderstood and they are thinking that he expects them to actually eat his flesh they have understood the metaphor that he has used 
for them it is a hard teaching because he is saying believe that i am from above and accept that all that i am saying is true and submit to it so he is saying we do not they they or they are saying they rather not submit because they still look at him as just the son of joseph so jesus says to them does this offend you what i'm saying does it does it offend you what is going to be your reaction when you literally see the son of man ascending to where he has come from so who knows you know uh, on uh, that uh, mount of olives later when jesus is ascending literally you know he he rises up off the ground and moves heavenward so at that point of time maybe some of these people were actually there watching so you know they would have remembered his words um this verse uh, 62 they would have remembered where he says then what if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before you know so some of them at least might have witnessed the ascension of jesus after the resurrection so the main point that he brings out here is that i am not just a human being i am from above so this is the heavenly bread that the father heavenly father is is sending you, all of you he is sending you this heavenly bread so that if you feed on me if you literally absorb everything that i am saying and make it a part of your being then you will have eternal life because of what i have spoken so are you willing to believe or not and many of his disciples it says they say this is a hard teaching we can't accept this they are willing to accept him as a prophet because he is doing miracles and they like that they like their um, needs being met so they are willing to accept him as a prophet but they're not willing to accept him as the son of god uh, and um, you know uh, to submit to him in that manner and um, so it says in verse 66 from that time onwards uh, many of them leave him many of his disciples the ones who called themselves his disciples they abandon him and they no longer follow him um but jesus says this in verse 63 in verse 63 he says the spirit gives life the flesh counts for nothing the words i have spoken to you they are full of the spirit and life one of the most um, you know important uh, helpful scriptures that you can you know absorb into um, your um, heart you know as believers where it says here that the words which jesus speaks to us they are full of the spirit and life so these words that we see in the in the bible you know because jesus is literally the word of god these words that we see in the bible they are full of the spirit of god himself and they are full of life these are not just ordinary words and so when we take our stand and place our faith on these words and hold on to them we will see the supernatural taking place in our lives because these are not natural words these are words which literally have the spirit of uh, god himself in them these are words which literally have eternal life in them so when we take a stand on these words no matter what circumstances we are facing no matter how big the you know ministry challenges are if we take our stand on these words the in the, you know in the word of god and say they are full of spirit and life so i know that they will come to pass nothing can stand in their way and in jesus name we cancel whatever is standing in our way you know these words will be fulfilled in our lives it's a fact so this is a very useful verse you know if we can remember this hold on to this and in our times of hardship during our challenges if we can claim this and say you know this is what jesus said the spirit gives life the flesh counts for nothing it's true i mean in our in our own flesh there's really nothing much that we will ever accomplish but when we take our stand on the words which jesus has spoken and those words which have the you know they are full of the spirit of god and full of eternal life if we stand on those words then you know um whatever the challenge may be that is standing in the way it has to fall away because uh, uh, these words of god 
they literally have the spirit of god in them and whatever he wants shall be fulfilled and so when there are many of these disciples even after hearing this they choose to turn away and reject him jesus turns to his 12 and he says to them what about you do you want to leave as well he says that in verse 67 in verse 67 and in verse 68 peter responds uh, so correctly he says lot to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life just now you explained to us that your words are full of life and the spirit so obviously you're the one who we are going to hold on to him and where else will we go who else can give us this eternal life only you so yes we're going to stick with you we are not leaving and then you know jesus says there is one you know who is of the devil so 11 of them they eat and drink of jesus i mean they, they still are not aware of how he's going to give his uh, you know uh, body on the cross and all of that they do not know those details uh, but at least in the in, in whatever sense they have understood this eating and drinking of him they actually absorb him into their being and they become part of his family but this 12th one he only keeps listening to these words at an intellectual level he hears them he sees the things that jesus is doing but it never becomes a part of him he never eats and drinks of jesus he only observes he only hears but he never really um takes it into his being and so he you know it says in verse 70 jesus says yet one of you is a devil so because he does not choose to eat and drink and make what jesus is saying a part of his being he remains a devil an opponent of god you know so uh, how do we avoid that by eating and drinking of him daily we choose to absorb his words into us we choose to stand on them we choose to obey them they literally become a part of us by doing this we abide in him and he abides in us and we bear much fruit you know so um, these are all the learnings which come out from this passage now we will have to move into chapter 7 um, so um, chapter 7 we see begins with the uh, Jewish festival of tabernacles and um, most of the godly people would go to Jerusalem for this feast to celebrate it over there so uh, Jesus family also gets ready to go to that place and um, they observe that Jesus is not getting ready along with them to go so they kind of make a sarcastic remark um, you know um, they say in verse 4 no one who wants to become a public figure uh, acts in secret since you are doing these things show yourself to the world so they're all getting ready to go over there Jesus is not getting ready he's just you no know, he's just continuing to wait he's just continuing to stay there in at home in Galilee so they say to him uh, what happened you know you uh, we thought you were very big uh, you know you you're saying all this great grand things about yourself about how you've come down from heaven and all of that so why are you hiding over here you know why are you not coming along with us uh, to the feast because um, over there at the feast you no know, is where you would have the big people the public figures so indirectly what are they saying in verse 4 no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret since you are doing these things show yourself to the world indirectly they are saying to him in a small place like here you know in, in this small town of galilee where we are living you know in nazareth it's easy to pretend to be big but when you go over there to jerusalem where all the big figures are going to be there there we will know for sure whether they really are big or not you know so um, over there will people accept you as someone uh, as this person who's come down from heaven you know so those are the mocking words which they use against him and we see that you know they continue with this attitude right up to the time of his uh, uh, death but then after he's resurrected um, uh, we learn in um, i think it was in first corinthians or second corinthians where it says you know jesus first uh, first corinthians uh, chapter 15 verse 7 jesus personally comes to james and appears to him and uh, maybe after that maybe he even uh, you know 
went to the other brothers and shows himself to them then when they literally see him come back from the dead then they believe that he indeed is from above from heaven and then you know they place their faith in him so uh, at this point of time they still do not believe in him and so they are saying when we all are getting ready to go to the feast why are you not joining us why are you hiding over here is it because you are a fake is it because you are a fraud you know but jesus says to them my time is not yet here the reason that he's holding back is not because he's afraid to go there he's holding back because it's not yet time for him to go so the brothers go on ahead he goes a little later when god tells him to go at that point of time he goes but he continues remaining silent for half the feast you know the feast goes on for um, oh i think two weeks or so so he uh, jesus does not speak up only half way through the festival after almost half the festival is finished that is when he actually um, begins to preach in public so jesus chooses to stay submissive to god's divine timing even though his brothers mocked him he does not change his timetable he continues to follow the timetable set for him by the lord and uh, so he just ignores all the negative comments that are being passed when he goes to the feast in secret uh, because that's what it says in in verse 10 that he goes over there in secret when he goes over there he hears all these discussions which are going on people are talking about jesus the in topic at that particular feast was jesus everyone wants to know where he is when is he going to come is he going to say something is he going to do some miracle a lot of discussion is going on but jesus does not speak a word he continues to remain silent until half the feast is over and then uh, in verse 14 we see we, it says not until halfway through the festival did jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach that is when he speaks up and um so um let us look at some of the things that are that uh he says uh maybe we can look at verses <clears throat> maybe verse 17 uh to verse 24 yeah, someone could read out for us uh john chapter 7 Verses seventeen up to verse twenty-four, please. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks for himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, "You have a demon who is seeking to kill you." Je- uh, Jesus answered and said to them, "I do not. I did one work, and you all marvel." Moses therefore. gave you circumcision not that it is from Moses but from the fathers and you circumcise a man on the sabbath if a man receive circumcision on the sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken are you angry with me because i made a complete uh, i made a man completely well on the sabbath do not judge according to the appearance but judge with righteous judgment yeah so here they all are a large crowd here at this very important feast and the people are discussing jesus they're asking each other when is he going to come when is he going to speak who do you think he is is he the expected messiah and when the leaders see how popular jesus has become and everyone is talking about him they start making plans to kill him and jesus is aware of this and uh, so jesus says uh, in verse 17 anyone who chooses to do the will of god will find out whether my teaching comes from god or whether i speak on my own because you see those who um, wish to hear from the father and genuinely do what the father is saying they will have hearts which are open to what jesus is saying 
uh, because he says earlier in, um, I think probably it was in the last um, chapter, he says, uh, you know, whoever, uh, or I think it was in this chapter, in, in chapter six, yeah, uh, whoever is, you know accepts the father uh, accepts me. So those who are open and whose hearts are right and who are willing to believe the truth, they will automatically be open to what Jesus is saying because they are for the truth. It's the ones who are hypocrites, the ones who are pretending to be spiritual, but in reality, they do not want to know the truth. They do not want to follow the truth. They do not want to obey the truth. For such people, automatically what Jesus is saying will sound, um, uh, it will not sound logical. Uh, their minds are blocked to these things because in their heart, they really do not want to know the truth. So Jesus says, the reason that you people are finding it so difficult to believe in what I am saying is maybe because you are not even open to doing God's will. Maybe your, your entire heart attitude is wrong, which is why the things which I am saying are not getting through to you. And he, in fact, makes it very plain in case they you know they have not clearly understood what he is indicating. He goes on to say in verses nine, verse 19, he says, you know, you talk about the law of Moses and how you want to keep it and all of that. But you people are not keeping the law of Moses. Because the law of Moses says you're not supposed to kill. But here you are making plans to kill me. <laughs> you know, and you, you so it shows that you are not really interested in doing the will of God. You're not interested in keeping the law of Moses. Uh, and yet here you are making accusations against me. Immediately uh, there, uh, you know, the, the, the crowd responds and says, You must be demon possessed. Who is trying to kill you? Why are you saying that you're trying to kill? And um, we see that confirmed later in verse 25, you know, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man that they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? So it's basically public knowledge. Everyone knows that now they are doing, you know, conspiring to try and kill him. It's a known fact. And uh, so Jesus just goes on to say, you know, rather than uh, addressing the accusation which they make about him being demon possessed, he just simply says this. He says in verse 21, I did one miracle and you're all amazed. Um, and he goes on to say in, uh, maybe we should actually read out these verses. If we can have someone read out for us, uh, John chapter 7, verses 21 to 24, please. 21 to 24. Oh, we, we actually had, uh, you know, sister reading out for us. So yes, you already looked at these verses. So let me just get into the explanation. Yeah. Um, so Jesus says, uh, so much opposition has started because I did a miracle, which was a sign to show that I am from God and that I am divine. And that has led to so much opposition. But why are you amazed? Um, you know, um, when Moses gave you the command that you should be circumcised, uh, you have followed that commandment strictly. So according to the law of Moses, on the eighth day, you know, the, uh, the male baby would be circumcised. And so if the eighth day happens to be a Sabbath day, even though it's a Sabbath day, they'll go ahead and do the circumcision ceremony because, you know, circumcision is basically how you... you Kind of formally become an Israelite. You know, now you're regarded as part of the um, community of God. So for them, it was a very, very important thing. And so um, they were willing to do that ceremony even on the Sabbath day. And Jesus says, I didn't just simply, you know, circumcise somebody. I, in fact, healed that entire man's body when I healed him on the Sabbath day. And that has led to so much controversy. And you're all so angry about it. Uh, why? When you're willing to keep something, uh, a small commandment like the circumcision and do it on the Sabbath day, I have done gone further. I have not only healed that particular man's heart, not only circumcised his heart, I have circumcised and healed his entire body. So you should, in fact, be glad that uh, I know I have followed in your footsteps in the same way you have done good on the Sabbath. I have done a greater good on the Sabbath. So why are you amazed? Why are you planning to kill me? So Jesus very directly answers them you know, back 
and he says in verse 24 stop judging by mere appearances but instead judge correctly all the facts are before you so he says judge correctly you know rather than um, judging in the wrong manner so here we see jesus um, you know um, counteracting all that they are saying the accusations which they have been making and um, now this is the response of the people after Jesus has spoken these things. Um, maybe if we can read out verses 27 to 29. Yeah, if someone could read out for us, uh, verses 27 to 29. Verse 7 to 29. But we know where this man come from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed, and he stopped in the temple. You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you know you do not know. I know, I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. All right, so um, the words that Jesus is speaking sound very convincing. The arguments are very logical. You know, he's taking things from their own law, from the law of Moses, and he's, you know, proving his case. So everything that he's saying is so convincing. And now the people are very confused uh, because they have all this half-baked ideas about who the Messiah will be and how, uh, uh, how he will appear and all of that. And uh, so uh, when they just look at Jesus and listen to him, whatever he's saying is just kind of piercing their hearts and it's so believable. But when they, when they start considering other factors, they're a little confused because you have some people over here, you know, um, who are saying, oh, they were trying to kill him. So maybe, you know, he's a fake person. And then there are other people who are saying, no, no, when the Messiah comes, nobody will know from where he, where, he, where he is going to come. On the other hand, this person, we know from where he is. You know, he's from Nazareth. We know him. But actually, you know, they have, they have their facts wrong. Because um, verse 27, the statement that is made over there, very defective sentence. Uh, you know, it's a, the, the, those people are saying, but we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. That's a very wrong statement, right? Because if you remember the, you know, uh, the Christmas story, um, you know, the the wise men have come, and they do not know where to find the Messiah, and so they approach the uh, the leaders, the chief priests. Uh, the the chief priests tell Herod very clearly, this is exactly from where the Messiah will come. So here you basically have a crowd which is saying different things. Um, they don't have full knowledge. They all have some wrong ideas about the Messiah. And they're having these discussions between them and saying, oh, but the Messiah will be from an unknown place, which is not true, because very clearly the chief priests tell Herod exactly from where the Messiah will come. And uh, in fact, later on, we see in the same passage, you know, uh, some people say, oh, the Messiah is supposed to come from, um, uh, you know, from the line of David, but this man is from uh, Nazareth. So you know all these different opinions are being um, are, are being expressed by the crowd, and uh, so to clear the air, to clear all the doubts, Jesus literally stands in the temple courts and cries out. He says, "Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from." But you know he's saying this more to me than that. He says, "I'm not here on my own authority." But he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. So he, Jesus is saying, yes, I, you're all aware that I am from Nazareth. You're all aware that I know I uh, live in the home of Joseph, but I'm not here on my own authority. Someone has sent me from above. So he says, I know him because I have come from him. And he's the one who sent me. Now, how many of you are willing to believe this and accept this? You know, it's, it's, it's the um, statement that Jesus is making. So when Jesus clearly speaks these words, 
and you know tries to clear the doubts which the people are having uh, the leaders try to seize him that is what it says in verse 30 at this they try to seize him but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come so uh, i'm not sure what kind of conspiracy they tried to hatch at that particular point of time but it did not succeed okay so um then um jesus goes on to say some more things maybe we could look at verses 33 to 36 yeah if someone could read out for us verses 33 to 36 <laughs> John 7, 33 to 36. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. He will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is these things that he said? You will seek me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Okay, so, so when they tried to arrest him, but they are unable to, whatever conspiracy they come up with at this particular point of time, it does not succeed. And uh, um, so at that time, Jesus uh, announces in public and he says, you know, now I'm openly here. I'm openly sharing who I am and I'm giving you a chance to place your trust in me. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, a short time offer. You know, you can you can say that, you know, for these for these particular people, this these leaders, this chief priests and Pharisees who are uh, who are actively trying to uh, bring him down. He says to them, you know, I'm openly among you, announcing to you who I am, offering myself to you, giving you a chance to believe in me. You know, take it while, you know, while, it, while it's still available. Because he says, a day will come when you will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am going, you will not be able to come there. You know, even if you call yourself sons of Abraham, you will not be able to come over there. Now is the time when, 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 when my offer is open and available that you should accept it. And uh, they are confused and they say, why, where is he going to go? Is he going to go, you know, to the, you know, Egypt and Babylon and all these other places where you have uh, some of the Jewish community living? Uh, is he going to go over there and start preaching over there? You know, is what, uh, so uh, is what they say among themselves. But of course, Jesus was indicating that um, once he has finished his task over here, he will be ascending back to where he has come from. And they will not be able to follow him over there unless they have placed their faith in him. Okay, So um, that is what Jesus is referring to. So he probably continues to you know, go on saying these things uh, through all the days of, you know, the remaining days of the feast. And then finally, on the last day, this is the proclamation that he loudly makes. Um, uh, and uh, so if we can look at verses um, 37 to 39, please. Verses 37 to 39. On the last day, the good day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst let him come to me and drink he who believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water but this is for concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the holy spirit was not yet given because jesus was not yet glorified yeah so a lot has happened during this festival uh at the beginning of the festival People are eagerly waiting for him to appear. They're very curious to see what's going to happen next. And finally, halfway through the festival, Jesus speaks up. He starts telling, this is who I am. And that leads to a lot of discussion. And then uh, the 
um, leaders try to arrest him. They're unable to do it. Uh, then uh, Jesus very plainly says, you know, you, this is the time that you should be receiving me. If you don't do it, you know, uh, there's going to come a time when you will not be able to come where I am going. So all of this Jesus, Jesus has said, and he probably continues to say those things for the remaining days of the feast. And now finally, we have come to the last day, which is like the um, you know finale, the, gr the greatest, grandest day of the festival. And on this day, Jesus stands there, probably right there in the middle of the courtyard, you know, and um, everyone is very eager to see him, to hear him. So he has everyone's attention. And this is what he says in a loud voice. He says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. All the things that Jesus says over here are very, very significant. Um, because um, this, uh, this, um, festival, a uh, tabernacle festival, uh, there were three main uh, ceremonies involved. One, of course, you know, the people would, uh, some of them would, would build small uh, tabernacles, small tents, and they would live in that as, uh, as a memorial of what God did for their ancestors, uh, you know, long back. Uh, so that would be one of the ceremonies you know, uh, where people would build small tents, small tabernacles to remind themselves that once upon a time, they didn't have a land of their own. They were wanderers living in tents, going from place to place. And then finally, one day, God gave them their own land. Uh, so that was one main uh, ceremony in this festival. Second, they would draw water from a well and they would pour it out on the altar. This was supposed to be a reminder to them of how God provided water to them in the wilderness when they, you know, when they had no, um, no regular sources of water. So miraculously, again and again, God provided water for them. That was the second important ceremony. The third one um, would be, you know, in the in the temple court of the women over there. They would light up that entire place with lots of. Um, Candle is a modern word, so they didn't, they didn't have candles. You know, they had those, um, what do you call them? Um, you know, those um, traditional uh, lamps which they lit. Uh, so that they would have lots of those uh, with which that entire temp the, the temple court, which is called temple court for women, that would be decorated. So these are the three main things. So Jesus is basically actually touching upon all these three main ceremonies. And he's pointing out that those all the three are met in him. So in the same way, uh, you know, in the earlier time of the Israelites, God dwelt among them and he brought them into the promised land. Now he has again come down to be with them. Uh, you know, he's come down from above to be among them. And now he is saying, the ceremony that you do regarding the water, drawing the water from the well and pouring it on, onto the altar, um, it is a reminder to you of how you had physical water being given to you by God. But now, here is somebody who can quench not just your physical thirst, but even your spiritual thirst. And then later on, when we go to the next chapter, we see he also refers to the third ceremony. You know, which is uh, the lighting of the, uh, you know, of all these lamps. And he says, I am the light of the world. So in fact, uh, indirectly, Jesus is pointing out that all these things which they are doing in this festival, they're actually fulfilled in him. They're all pointing towards him. So right now, he's point, uh, you know, taking up one particular point regarding the water. So he stands there and in a loud voice, he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. In other words, he's saying back then Moses gave you physical water. But now if you come to me, I can quench your uh, spiritual thirst forever. Because he says, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. They will receive the Holy Spirit, you see, and that Holy Spirit who is within them will always be there to quench their spiritual thirst. So they will never have to run dry ever again. 
and they will always have eternal life because of him so these are the things which jesus proclaims to them and the only requirement that they need you know from their side is they need to place their faith in him if they choose to believe in him choose to believe that he has come down from above and that he is the living bread if they can take his words and absorb them into their being and follow him then they will have eternal life if they are willing to accept these things then automatically their spiritual thirst will be quenched their spiritual hunger will be satisfied so this is the proclamation that jesus makes on the last and final day um and it says in verse 40 on hearing his words some of the people said surely this man is the prophet others said he is the messiah still others asked uh, how can the messiah come from galilee should he not come you know it, it goes on to say in the next verse um, you know he should in fact be a descendant of david from bethlehem and they are not aware of the fact that yes jesus was very much he you know uh, he was taken over there i mean before he was born joseph and mary go over there you know to um to give their um registry for the census in bethlehem so yes very much jesus is very much from bethlehem uh, so they are they are not aware of that fact and so they say shouldn't the messiah actually be from bethlehem so there's a lot of talk again going on and uh, the temple guards who have been sent to arrest him they come back to the leaders empty handed and then the pharisees say why didn't you bring him and the people say how could we do that you know when uh, everyone uh, is supporting him everyone is speaking favorably about him so we we were unable to uh, you know uh, arrest him and then it's interesting what the pharisees say i think we should read this portion uh, if we can have someone read out for us verses 47 up to verse 52 yeah uh, john chapter 7 uh from 47 up to verse 52 please then the pharisees answered them are you also deceived have any of the rulers of the pharisees believed in him but this crowd that doesn't know the law is accursed Nicodemus he who came to Jesus by night being one of them said to them does our lord judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing they answer and said to him are you also from galilee search and look for no prophet has arisen out of galilee yes, so and oh yeah please go ahead yeah yeah and everyone went to his own house yeah um so um the crowd a lot of them seem to be convinced that this is the true messiah the words which jesus has spoken has you know pierced their hearts and they are willing to believe and the uh, the temple guards who were sent to do the arrest in fact felt afraid because the crowd is so much on jesus side that they are hesitant to make a public arrest because you know probably the mob would have attacked them so they come back empty handed and uh, they say you know everyone is speaking in favor of him so there was nothing that we could do and we had to come away and the leaders mockingly they say oh so what just like the crowd you know like the ignorant crowd you also got deceived is it and then they say in verse 48 have any of the rulers or or the pharisees believed in him you know look at us none of us have believed in him we are the rulers uh, you know um, because um, most of the uh, rulers of the synagogue were chosen from among the pharisaic community so they say look at us none of the pharisees have believed we the rulers also have we, we the rulers of the synagogue we also have not believed and right there sitting among them is nicodemus who is a ruler of the synagogue and he is a pharisee and he actually has placed his trust in jesus uh, so they are not actually aware of this fact as yet so it looks like nicodemus has not revealed his faith you know at this point of time and so uh, they say you know none of us have believed it's only the ignorant crowd which has believed him is what they say uh, but 
Nicodemus, in fact, is a ruler and a Pharisee who has believed. And he says, he speaks up and he says, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? You know, so is what he says. So they are very, very upset when he, when uh, Nicodemus speaks up for Jesus. And they say, oh, what? You also have become a Galilean, is it? Because those Galileans, they don't have much knowledge about the things of God. So are you like that? Are you also ignorant? And they go on to, and they go on to say something which actually exposes their ignorance. They say, look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Very, very wrong statement. Because Jonah was a prophet who comes out of Galilee. And we, 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 you know, we see this in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. He was from a place called Gath Hefer, which was just three miles north of Nazareth. So just in the previous sentence, they said the crowd is ignorant. They don't know anything. And they got deceived. Now, you know, we are the rulers of the synagogue. We don't get deceived. We have all our facts right. And then they go on to say, you know what, look into it. Look into the scriptures. You'll discover that no prophet ever came out of Galilee. But the point is, Jonah actually came out of Galilee. So even they actually did not know their facts. So there's a lot of irony in this passage, uh, you know, um, which uh, comes out even as we are reflecting on these things. So... Um, so um, this, I think, was one main occasion where Jesus got to, um, you know, Jesus very quietly waited until he got the green signal from heaven to speak out. And then he began to speak out with such power that a large amount of the crowd which heard him got, uh, you know, got to have a clear presentation of facts. Jesus was saying, this is who I am. Yes, it's true that I am from Nazareth. But it's also true that I am from above, you know, and he placed the facts very clearly before them. Everyone got a chance to hear, you know, the entire crowd that had come. They got a chance to hear exactly what Jesus is saying about himself. So now the decision rested in their hands. So I think this was one very important occasion where Jesus got to uh, minister to a large crowd, to very important people who would have been present. And uh, he gives them the facts very, very clearly. And he says to them, I am the bread. I am, uh, okay, the, 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 um, I am the, um, the living waters. So now, you know, it is uh, up to the people to take their decision. So these are all the things that we could, you know, very briefly look at. Um, these were very lengthy chapters. So I'm very sorry. We, it was impossible to go through it verse by verse. So I just kind of picked out the main things and, you know, hope to get the main facts across. Uh, so I hope you found the class helpful. Uh, let's just close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for all that we could learn uh, today in our class. Uh, yes, Lord. Your words are full of spirit and life. If we choose to believe in these words, if we choose to obey them and submit, uh, just as Nicodemus did, then, oh Lord, our lives can be uh, changed and transformed. We can be like Jesus, who even though had limited resources at hand, you know, when he was with that crowd, he was able to perform a great miracle that met every need, O oh Lord, of that large crowd. So we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to stand on your words, which are full of life and, and spirit. And I pray that you would help us to obey them and submit to them and follow your divine timetable and do everything that you're asking us to do, following every word, so that, Lord, we can have that same authority and power which Jesus did so that it will not matter, O oh Lord, whether the resources in our hands are less or large, it will be adequate. We will be able to do what we have been sent forth to do, O oh Lord, in the places where you have uh, established us. So we pray, O oh Lord, whether we are in the secular field or whether we are in the full-time ministry, you would help us to be people who can walk in power because we have chosen to believe in you and submit to you, O oh Lord. Help us to live in a way that honors you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
thank you we'll meet again next class Thank <laughs> you.